Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Jason Radmaker, the pastor of Asbury Crestwood United Methodist Church in Tuckahoe, New York. And on behalf of our entire congregation, thank you for being here and being a part of this time of online worship. Before we enter into the service, I'd like to draw your attention to a link that you'll find just below the video on the church's YouTube channel. That link will take you to an online ministry check-in page. Think of it as a digital version of the old-fashioned attendance pad that you'd pass down the pew on a Sunday morning. It would be a tremendous help to Asbury if you would click on that link and let us know that you're here. We're glad you're here, wherever you're logging in from today. So now, let's go in to worship together. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture today comes from the book of 1 Kings. We're reading chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. And he looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, 
from death into life. One of the happy side effects for me of having a child who is a huge fan of the Beatles is the way in which my opinion of John Lennon has changed so dramatically in recent years. For the longest time, you see, I didn't think much about John Lennon or his music at all, but when I did, my opinion was pretty harsh. I thought it was arrogant. I thought Imagine was an incredibly overrated song. I thought that John, Paul, George, and Ringo together were much greater than the sum of their individual parts. Now, I still think all those things are true, but I've come to realize that that's all only part of John Lennon's story, a story about an incredibly public, controversial, talented, and celebrated life that, like the lives of so many great artists, ultimately reveals valuable truths about us, about human nature. Less than 17 years passed between the Beatles' first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964 and Lennon's murder on December 8, 1980. During that tragically brief career, Lennon reached a level of fame and influence that few rock stars, that few artists have ever obtained. And then he had to answer one of life's most deviling, bedeviling questions. What comes next? After I've achieved my dreams, after my life has exceeded my wildest expectations, What's my second act? Where do I go from here? He was just 29 when the Beatles broke up. Over the next few years, including an 18 month long self-described lost weekend, John made some great records for sure, but by 33, he was divorced and alienated from his first wife and child to whom he had been terribly cruel. He was separated from Yoko Ono and he was making headlines with his drunken antics. But in 1975, John and Yoko reconciled. Later that year, they had a child, a son, and John decided to become a stay-at-home father. He withdrew from the music business altogether. Now, for the remainder of the decade, John lived a life that was about as far removed from Beatlemania as possible. Waking up early to make his son breakfast, watching Sesame Street on television, taking walks in Central Park. It all seemed so normal. Well, John carried that new sense of normal, that newfound appreciation and family with him when he returned to the music studio in 1980. Watching the Wheels is one of the songs he recorded that year. And it's one of my favorites that he ever wrote. In that lyric, John gives voice to those who questioned his decision to chart a new path for his life. We know those voices too, when we stop to think about it. They tell us to measure everything in dollars and cents. They tempt us to live to work rather than work to live. They try to keep us in a box rather than allowing us to grow and evolve and change. <clears throat> we know how loudly those voices can shout at us. But John wasn't listening to voices like that anymore. I'm just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round, he said. I really love to watch them roll, no longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just had to let it go. <clears throat> watching the wheels became, came to my mind recently when I read the opening passage of Father Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward. There, Rohr writes this, there is much evidence on several levels that there are at least two major tasks to human life. First is to build a strong container or identity. The second is to find the contents that the container was meant to hold. Now, I believe that watching the wheels and other songs like Just Like Starting Over and Beautiful Boy, some of the songs that John recorded in 1980, these indicate that he was beginning to understand what he wanted his life to hold and what he had to let go of if he really wanted to enjoy life and be his best self. For me, those so final songs only add to the sense of tragedy over his death because we never got to see and hear how that new understanding and appreciation 
might have influenced his art in years to come. In my mind, John Lennon and Johnny Cash would have made a great album together in the 1990s. And it's sad that we never got to hear that album together. Lennon's arc of success, followed by a crash, and then arriving at a new perspective earned through a slow period and an openness to change is surprisingly helpful in our efforts to unpack the scripture about the prophet Elijah that we've heard today. Elijah is one of the Bible's rock star for personas, for sure, a performer of miracles, the likes of which God's people had not seen since the days of Moses. Big things, big actions seem to follow Elijah everywhere he went. Among the pyrotechnics of his ministry, among the big grandiose displays, however, he's most known as the standard bearer against the Bible's most wicked king, King Ahab, and Ahab's devious queen, Queen Jezebel. Ahab's most appalling error, his grave sin from Elijah's perspective, was forsaking the proper worship of God and empowering and encouraging within his kingdom the cult of Baal instead. Baal was a god worshipped by, by people in that part of the world, by many people at that in that time. He was regarded as the god of rain and storms and fertility, often represented by an idol, a bull, uh, what, what was the, the common depiction of him in a physical form. The significance, though, of Ahab's crime was really a total rejection of the covenant with, with God that was at the heart of Israel's identity. This was a rejection of the God of Abraham, a rejection of the God who had led the people out of Egypt, broke their bonds of slavery and set them free in a promised land. This was a rejection of all of that for, for something else. Well, Elijah met face to face with Ahab and Jezebel's coterie of 850 prophets at a place called Mount Carmel. And in the inevitable showdown, Elijah, again, that rock star that he was, he mocks them and he taunts them and, and he's kind of commanding the stage with what he says and what he does. And it certainly seems to get under the skin of Baal's prophets. And, and it starts to, the whole scene starts to dissolve, de devolve into, into, a, into a bit of madness. There's blood and there's fire and there's violence. And then in the end, Elijah alone came down the mountain, feeling vindicated and triumphant. We heard about what happened next from the scripture we read today. Ahab told Jezebel all that the prophet had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more too, if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Imagine that the prophet has taken to the stage, he's commanded it, he's, he's, he's won the day. And his actions and bold moves were totally useless. They achieved nothing. Instead, when word reached the royal palace about what had happened on Mount Carmel, they're totally unmoved. In fact, Jezebel doubles down on their desire to just eliminate Elijah all together. And how did the great prophet respond to that? He was afraid, the scripture says. He got up and he fled for his life. On the heels of his triumph, Je Elijah was on the lamb, realizing that all he had accomplished, he had accomplished nothing more than further provoking the king and queen. The prophet has what can only be described as, 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 as an intense crisis. He was afraid, he was discouraged, and he left everyone and everything behind and prayed that God would just end his life. Elijah's boasting among the other prophets stands in sharp contrast to his rather pitiful wilderness lament. It's enough now, God. Take my life away. I'm no better than my ancestors. I thought I was something big, he seems to be saying. I thought I, thought power, I, thought I had a power. I thought I had influence. I thought I could bring about change. But I'm just like everyone who's ever gone before me. But an angel of life, not death, visited Elijah that night. That angel blessed him with bread and water. And in the strength that he took from that, 
Elijah continued on a journey further into the wilderness. He walked for 40 days and 40 nights, the scripture says. And if you've ever read your Bible, you should know that whenever anyone does something for 40 days and 40 nights, something big is probably going to happen. For 40 days and 40 nights, Elijah went on until he reached the very mountain where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And there on that mountain, Elijah crawled into a cave and he went to sleep. What happens next is a big moment. It's probably the most memorable moment in all of Elijah's life. And it's not about any of his pyrotechnics or power or anything at all. Instead, it goes like this. On that mountain, there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of sheer silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And Elijah and the Lord spoke there on the other side of life's chaos. Elijah would return from the mountain and he would continue his ministry. And yes, there would be more confrontations with Ahab and Jezebel, with their prophets too, more scenes of Iron Age political intrigue and violence and warfare that challenge our 21st century sensibilities. I certainly don't want you to think that, oh, the story is all peace and love from that time on. No, that's not what happens. But Elijah does come back, and there does seem to be a a greater purpose and a greater level of faith, not in his own action and his own ability, but in what God can do and in the change that God can bring about, not only in a human heart, but among nations within a kingdom in the pursuit of justice and what is fair and what is good. Something from the past needed to be released so that a God-centered future could be embraced. Now, I get it. Comparing the lives of John Lennon and the prophet Elijah seems like a good way for a preacher to get themselves lost in the weeds of a sermon. However, I do see a similarity in their stories that I lift up today for your edification. A period of success, followed by a crash, and then arriving at a new perspective through a slow period and an openness to change. John Lennon experienced that, the prophet Elijah experienced that, and I would say that if we're honest about it, most of us have experienced something like that too. We might even be able to find ourselves on that timeline today. Are you living somewhere on that spectrum, on that plot line right now? Our faith invites us to be born again and again and again, and I think that that, that image from the, that Jesus gives us in the Gospel of John, it speaks to this very rhythm of life, of, of life success and failure and, and picking it up and trying something new with God's help. And part of that born again experience, part of that heart renewing experience is to find our true and best selves in the rhythm made possible by Good Friday and Easter, by death and resurrection, by letting go of the things that fade and holding fast to that which endures forever. As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a grace you see that's offered to all of us in the midst of our lost weekends and our moments on the other side of chaos. That grace gives us the opportunity to become very clear about what matters most to us, about what Richard Rohr calls the contents of our container. From our collective experience of this pandemic to your personal experience of life's storms and fires and earthquakes, I pray that you and that we as a people are open to receive that gift because there's strength and sustenance in guidance in what God offers to us. There are new paths and purposeful steps for you to take. There are burdens and junk that you can leave that you don't need to carry anymore. No longer riding on the merry-go-round, you can let go and take hold of something 
that really, truly matters. Imagine that. Thanks be to God for this good news today. Amen and amen. We come now to the time that we set aside each week to pause, to take a deep breath, and to come before God with our hopes, our dreams, all that we carry within our hearts and spirits in prayer. Would you pray with me now? O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Prayers for hope for those who feel hopeless. Prayers for healing for those who need healing. Prayers for jobs for those who are jobless. Prayers for community for those who feel lonely. Prayers for peace for those whose lives are filled with conflict. Prayers for understanding for those seeking to be understood. Prayers for comfort for those who grieve. Prayers for food for those who hunger. Prayers for shelter for those who are homeless. Prayers for clean water for those whose waters are contaminated. Prayers for rain for those who live in drought. Prayers for a time of drying for those who are facing too much rain. Prayers for freedom for those who live under dictatorships. Prayers for, prayers for wisdom for our leaders. Prayers for spiritual growth and health for our churches. Prayers for your kingdom to reign here on earth. Amen. And now let us continue to pray with the confidence of God's children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as you go from this place of worship into life, go with the confidence that you are loved. Go with the confidence that the God of grace has come to you to make possible your greatest success, to bear with you through those times of struggle and chaos. And on the other side of that chaos, to make your footsteps firm, that you might go forward with confidence, bearing witness to the love that makes life real. Go from this place then in the name of the God whose love makes this life real, the one revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.